Uh, thank you very much for your patience. I believe we can now start our webinar on eliminating the use of dental amalgam in the EU. Uh, for your information, I would like to highlight that the webinar will be recorded and the recordings will be uh, provided afterwards to all the participants. But first of all, for those of you that are not very familiar with our organization, uh, Health Code of Harm Europe is a non-profit coalition of hospitals, healthcare systems, healthcare pro professionals, and also local authorities and research institutions uh, that brings the voice of healthcare professionals to the European policy debate about issues such as chemicals, including mercury, climate change and health, but also sustainable procurement or food. We educate the healthcare sector to understand the importance of the environment and press healthcare leaders and professionals to advocate for broader social policies and changes. We want to mobilize ethical and economic and political influence to create an ecologically sustainable, equitable, and healthy world. Our mission, accordingly, is to transform healthcare worldwide so that it reduces its environmental footprint. And we want to achieve this mission by protecting public health from climate change, transforming the supply chain, and building leadership for environmental health. We work on several policy areas, including pharmaceuticals, chemicals, also climate and energy, sustainable and healthy food, sustainable procurement, and waste and resources. We have over 80 members in 25 countries uh, of the WHO European region, including 16 member states of the European Union. Uh, the membership is based on an organizational commitment to our mission and goals. To achieve our goals, we've established the Global Green and Healthy Hospitals network that gathers hospitals, healthcare facilities, health systems, and health organizations that are dedicated to reducing their environmental footprint and promoting public and environmental health. Through the network, we help our members to achieve their sustainability goals um, and protect public health from climate change. We do so by providing tools uh, and measures to estimate environmental footprint and also through issuing learning materials and working within our online platforms to provide le learning opportunities for our members. We have over a thousand members from 54 countries that represents the interest of over 32,000 hospitals and health centers on five continents. Now, getting closer to a topic of our present of our webinar today, uh, Health Code of Harm Europe has been working on the issue of safer chemicals, including mercury, since 2004. Um, our last publication on dental amalgam in the EU issued in 2017 um, was our attempt to highlight the issue of dental amalgam, and this webinar is a follow-up to that publication as well. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers, Elena Limberdi Settimo, Project Ma Manager from Zero Mercury Campaign European Environmental Bureau, Charlie Brown, Attorney and President, World Alliance for Mercury Free Dentistry, and Florian Schulze, Project Management from EG Umwelt Sun Medicine. Elena, I would like to give the floor to you. Before that, I would like to introduce your background to our audience. Uh, Elena is the EB Zero Mercury Campaign Project 
manager since 2004, Zero Mercury Working Group co-founder and co-coordinator following Mercury policies at EU and globally since 2005. She has over 15 years of experience in EU environmental policy, mainly in the field of chemicals, waste and products, as well as on project management and monitoring, having also worked at the European Commission. And Elena will highlight today European and international legislation state of play when it comes to mercury in the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar to advance uh, the work towards uh, eliminating the use of dental amalgam in the EU. Uh, I will start about presenting shortly the, our organization, then introduce uh, Mercury, its health effects and uses. Um, then uh, I will introduce the legislative state of play and respective dental amalgam provisions at international and at EU level. The European Environmental Bureau, where I work, it's uh, Europe's largest network of environmental citizens' organizations. We have over 140 civil society organizations, including European networks, from more than 30 European countries. The EB has over 40 years of uh, EU environmental policy expertise, and it tackles most pressing environmental problems at the EU level. We have been working on mercury since 2004, uh, dental amalgam has been one of the issues we've been following, and the first uh, dental conference uh, was organized in 2007. Um, as, we, as we all know, uh, mercury is a heavy metal. It can be found in nature as a cinnabar ore, the reddish uh, stone that you can see on your screen. Mercury and its compounds are toxic to human health and the environment, especially in the developing nervous system. Microbial metabolism of deposited mercury can create methylmercury, which is its most toxic form, and it has the capacity to collect in organisms by accumulate and to concentrate up the food chains, biomagnify, especially in the aquatic food chain. You can see also the mercury recycle on your right. Methylmercury is a well-documented neurotoxicant which may cause adverse effects on the developing brain. It readily passes both the placental barrier and the blood-brain barrier. Therefore, exposures during pregnancy are of highest concern. It may also cause adverse effects on the cardiovascular system, thereby leading to increased mortality. Methylmercury compounds are considered possible carcinogens to humans. Furthermore, inhalation of elemental mercury vapor include symptoms such as tremors, insomnia, memory loss, neuromuscular changes, and headaches. Uh, elemental mercury is a, is a persistent chemical, and it can travel all around the world, and as such, it's, the, it's considered as a global pollutant. One of the main historical examples of the health impacts of mercury occurred in Minamata, Japan. A chemical factory was releasing mercury, a uh, contaminated effluent containing methylmercury, into the Minamata Bay between 1932 and 1968. Um, in the early, since the early 1950s, animals started to behave strangely. In 1956, people started to show symptoms of an unknown until then neurological disease, which would later be called Minamata disease and which had severe and detrimental impacts on animals and humans, particularly on the central nervous system. Eventually, they realized that this was because of the mercury that was coming out of the factory. Thousands of people suffering from the effects of the Minamata disease still survive today, and hundreds of lives have been lost as a result of this industrial disaster. Going now into how mercury gets into the environment, as you can see, uh, mercury can get into our environment from natural sources, uh, from volcanoes, erosion, or forest fires, but uh, a biggest part it's because of the human uh, use. Uh, you can see on the chart pile on your right uh, that the highest emissions in the air are coming from uh, the use of, uh, mer of mercury in the artisanal and small-scale gold mining, 
and then followed by emissions from coal combustion as mercury occurs naturally in coal. Emissions are also coming out of the cement production, metal production, uh, large-scale gold production, but also when mercury-containing products become waste. Looking now more into the uh, products and, uh, and on the mercury use and demand, as can be seen, uh, mercury is used intentionally to extract uh, gold in artisanal small-scale uh, mining. Also, it's used for the uh, production of PVC, but also in the chloralkali industry. And then, as you can see, one-third of the total demand of mercury is used for mercury-added products. Looking further now into these products, we can see that it has been used uh, for in batteries, in dentistry, of course, in measuring and control devices, lamps, electric and electronic devices, and other applications. And further looking within these products, we can see that a big part is relevant to healthcare. As we said, uh, a big part used for the dentistry, then used in thermometer production, speedbo manometer production, but also in skin lighting creams and topical antiseptics. Just looking a little bit uh, in the same way, we looked at the cycle of mercury uh, earlier on. Uh, in the same way, uh, we have the release of the environment from the dental care. Uh, when we have our amalgams uh, taking place, usually dental clinics, uh, the, the mercury used uh, will, would go to waste uh, to solid waste treatment or end up in wastewater treatment uh, and then eventually end up again in the air or soil and groundwater. And then eventually when uh, uh, people get cremated, um, if they have uh, dental amalgam fillings, uh, the mercury will be emitted in the atmosphere uh, or through burial in soil and groundwater and then eventually be released into the atmosphere, deposited in the water, be taken up by fish and, and then be eventually consumed potentially by humans. Now, given the, given the effects of mercury, the global community started looking into this issue at the beginning of uh, the years 2000. A global mercury assessment was launched and completed in 2002, where it basically showed that uh, mercury is a global pollutant and therefore action at global level was necessary. Discussions continued and the decision to have a legally binding instrument was taken in 2009. Negotiations started in 2010 and eventually uh, the Minamata Convention was adopted in 2013, um, in October 2013, um, and uh, signed at the time by 128 uh, parties. It eventually entered into force uh, last year on 16th of August uh, after 50 uh, countries uh, ratified it. And until now we have 99 ratifications uh, as per this month. The first conference of the parties took place last year and we have uh, the second conference of the parties coming up uh, next month. Now, the Minamata Convention uh, is quite a broad convention with respect to mercury. Its objective is to protect the human health and the environment from anthropogenic emissions and release of mercury and mercury compounds. It covers supply, trade, products, processes, artisanal small-scale gold mining, emissions, releases, storage, waste, and contaminated size. It's important to say that it has its own financial mechanism and further covers other aspects like health effects, capacity building, assistance uh, to developing countries, information and awareness raising. It looks at the implementation and compliance and eventually will be looking at evaluating its effectiveness. Now, if we look at the provisions of the Minamata Convention with relevance to the dental amalgam, dental amalgam is covered under Article 4 uh, under products. And according to that, uh, parties need to phase down the use of dental amalgam, uh, taking into account their domestic circumstances, but also uh, looking at relevant international guidance. And they need to, to do at least two out of the nine actions that you can see on your screens. Um, some are softer, some are harder to do, and they include the national objectives to minimize 
dental amalgam use, promote alternatives, uh, promote uh, the education of uh, in dental schools and professionals to educate students uh, on how to use alternatives rather than mercury, uh, look at the insurance system, and we're going to look at some of these aspects in the coming two presentations. Now, at the EU level, uh, the EU has identified that uh, mercury is problematic uh, since the early 60s and 70s, where mercury was included in different parts of uh, legislation, but more focus was given since 2005 when the EU mercury strategy was adopted. The dental amalgam was already identified as one important issue under this strategy, and eventually this led to the EU requesting its EU scientific committees for their opinion concerning the environmental and health effects of the dental amalgam use. This happened in 2008 and 2014. Um, and then eventually a further study was requested under the 2010 EU Mercury Strategy Review, which led to the uh, quite well-known uh, study of 2012, where it looked on dental amalgam and it shed a lot of light on, on figures and numbers and how member states are using dental amalgam and their alternatives. The outcome of this study was uh, that what was suggested by the consultant was that if we look at, uh, if we consider the environmental, social, and uh, economic perspective, the best solution would be to phase out the mercury use in dentistry at the EU level, and then at the same time for the member states to enforce their environmental management um, uh, concerning the dental uh, waste. Um, in the meantime, as we said, the Minamata Convention was then uh, adopted, and this uh, led to the EU looking at some gaps that it had in its legislation, and eventually the revised EU mercury legislation, uh, regulation of 2017 uh, was adopted uh, in, in May last year. If we look a little bit on the on the consumption on the mercury consumption at EU level, we can already see that uh, the mercury use in dentistry is now the highest use at EU level. You can look at the light green column. Uh, since uh, at the end of 2017, the use in the chlorine industry was banned. Uh, as such, uh, at the EU level, uh, the use of mercury in dental amalgam and what can be done with it it has a quite a high focus uh, right now. So the um, EU mercury regulation, as we said, was uh, adopted the last year, and uh, it was really a, a very big uh, step forward uh, with respect to the uh, regulating the dental amalgam uh, and the dentistry sector. Under Article 10 of the regulation, uh, from July this year, uh, the dental uh, amalgam has been banned for children under 15 years old for pregnant and breastfeeding women unless deemed strictly necessary by the dental practitioner on the ground of specific medical needs of the patient. Furthermore, provisions include that the member states should uh, develop and publish a national plan on measures to phase down the use of dental amalgam and further measures are also requested for dental practici practitioners not to allow the use of dental amalgam in bulk, but only in a capsulated form, uh, install separators uh, in their cleanings and handle with care uh, and uh, professionally the relative waste that would come out. What is important to say here is that through this regulation, the decision to phase out mercury amalgam in the EU has been taken. The question is when, and this is why the Commission shall report by 30 June 2020 um, on the feasibility of the phase out of the use of the dental amalgam in the long term and preferably by 2030. This is uh, as per the text of the regulation. And as a result, uh, we have seen uh, already that some of the EU countries have already uh, banned the dental amalgam use. This will be mentioned also in the coming up presentations. Uh, these uh, experiences were also incorporated in, uh, in a publication from the UNEP, uh, Lessons Learned from Countries. 
We can see that the EU regulation goes beyond the Minamata Convention. Uh, it bans the use uh, in children uh, and pregnant or breastfeeding women. And eventually, as uh, Europe, although Europe can serve as a model for other governments, a uh, full dental amalgam ban is possible at EU level and it needs to be pursued rapidly. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Elena, for your presentation. Uh, we'll proceed to our next speaker, Florian Schulze. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Florian Schulze. I'm a European coordinator of the uh, World Alliance uh, for Mercury Free Dentistry, and I'm uh, running of an NGO in uh, Germany, which is uh, for um, regard of civil protection of um, consumer protection for safe and tolerable um, dental materials and also for better for better for protection of um, environmental toxins. So well, I can just start and a bit uh, jumping in this uh, um, presentation. Uh, I will talk about uh, uh, especially the effect of uh, the amalgam, and, uh, amalgam ban on children and the switch to alternative uh, materials and show a little bit the, uh, the challenges and the opportunities in regard of the upcoming measurements in 2019 when uh, uh, each nation has to present a plan how to um, reduce amalgam fills more. So, I will begin with uh, with uh, explaining a little bit about the conditions in the single countries and uh, show the impact of the uh, partial ban in uh, July and then present uh, uh, some alternatives and uh, in the end show the opportunities for uh, for the first uh, national measurement. So if you can um, see on this slide is, uh, you can uh, see that the uh, the conditions were completely different in each uh, single country. We had a, a use from from uh, use from the from zero percent to up to ninety two percent of uh, amalgam in the various uh, uh, countries. This is, this is the use compared to um, mercury free alternatives. So you can see that there are three. Uh, green marked uh, countries, which are uh, already uh, mercury-free countries, almost. So I say you see that Denmark is uh, has a, a little bit has still a little bit of use of, uh, of mercury, it's three uh, percent. But in Denmark, uh, mercury, uh, dental amalgam is banned uh, and only allowed in uh, certain exceptions. So uh, I also highlighted Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And that's because uh, Lithuania, Lithu uh, Latvia, and Lithuania were part of the Soviet Union, where amalgam uh, used to be banned entirely uh, until uh, '92. So uh, all the uh, the member states of the Soviet Union um, never really got used to to uh, uh, to use uh, amalgam. They were used to um, use alternative fillings, and in most of the countries, there's almost non, uh, non, uh, no use of, uh, of amalgam at all, and so it will be um, easy to change for them. And uh, then I would like to highlight also Germany and Poland, uh, which are, I'm going to talk about a little later, because these are single countries of, um, which are uh, having um, a full reimbursement uh, scheme for for uh, um, for basic standard uh, treatment, dental treatment, and uh, I would like to talk about uh, a little bit about Italy. And coming to the next slide, because in most of the countries, European countries, there had uh, existed already or still exist uh, recommendations about the use of amalgam. So uh, it was not recommended to use it in, uh, in patients with. Uh, uh, nephro nephropathic diseases or which are allergic or breastfeeding or pregnant and uh, was not recommended to use it for, for children under the age of uh, six years. 
especially in Italy we have this uh, highly recommendation. And uh, we have uh, further more recommendations just to let you know it's that uh, we had a recommendation in uh, Germany to uh, for a safe removal, which means to use a, a slow uh, drill and um, provide enough fresh air and use a carbide burst and just to avoid uh, the the evaporation of the uh, of the mercury and that is very significant that the uh, patients should not have other metals in their mouth but uh, to on our next slide we can see that uh, now the uh, implementation of uh, uh, the um, partial ban in in July um, set the limit of the age to 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 15 years and uh, and pregnant or breastfeeding. So this is, is really a big evolution, big difference to which was new for to all all European countries, a part of the countries which had banned amalgam uh, already entirely. And uh, so this was uh, um, the reason for uh, for public awareness since uh, uh, patients should be informed, and this had been had been communi communicated in, in several countries, had been communicated very, very well, and there were many um, information on the television and uh, in the newspapers or also by the dental associations. In other countries like uh, Spain, for example, it was not uh, not communica communicated almost at all. And in other countries, like in Italy, the communication was uh, that now the European uh, uh, Communion is, uh, is aligning with the, with the Italian recommendations, which is not true since, uh, since you've seen before, there's a difference between children up to the age of six years and children up to the age of 15 years. So there is still, um, still some need for, uh, for further information and um, something which was uh, very interesting was that in several countries where the uh, the, the full reimbursement scheme, the public health insurance, this covers the uh, amalgam entirely, they had to find uh, an alternative material to substitute it. And uh, there were interesting uh, decisions made that in, uh, for example, in, Glass, in uh, Austria and Slovakia, the the uh, the material of choice become uh, became since uh, since July glass ionomers in the in, in Slovenia in Germany there were composites on the island of Scotland they uh, the dentists had a free choice of the material to use and it was fully reimbursed but in uh, Ireland and Scotland the reimbursement usually only rec uh, regards and the children and the special uh, population, like uh, children or uh, just unoccupied people or uh, uh, retired people. So what I want what I want to highlight is that uh, the change in Austria and Slovakia is very significant, since uh, now for the first time the glass ionomer become uh, officially recognized as. Uh, uh, an alternative, high quality alternative, which can can be used and uh, used also not only as a temporary solution, but at least as a, a long term uh, alternative. And uh, this was also the start for uh, for the for the industry, for the companies to promote their their products to say, okay, which if you have to, to use alternative. Um, please look at, at our product, and uh, you can see here this is an advertisement now for uh, of a company. I would just uh, like to quote it says that they say you can uh, choose different products which can be processed more easily and quickly than amalgam, yet which are just as cost effective and long lasting. So, these uh, materials obviously, obviously exist since uh, a long time and. Uh, we we know from the experiences of dentists that uh, most of these uh, materials are existing since uh, 30 years, now in use since 30 years, 
and uh, the uh, dentists make a good good uh, uh, good experiences with these materials. I would like to say just uh, briefly that. Uh, uh, I'm not cooperating with uh, with any any company. It's just to show you uh, a choice, and even uh, some of uh, of these uh, producers are still using still producing amalgam, and we would uh, really like to differentiate it with them. And um, um, but also they have uh, like uh, the, the direct extra is a good alternative. So what happened in the evolution of these materials is that uh, especially glass enamel cements and uh, bulk fill materials uh, have evolved in the in the last ten or twenty years, so that they really became a quality, high quality, effective and affordable alternative, which. Which is uh, which are already uh, very common in use. You can see on the right that um, for these alternative materials, you should compare it always with uh, ceramic inlays, which are uh, out of 100% uh, of course of uh, of ceramic. So you have um, a less uh, a smaller filler load in the other materials, but still with new technologies, with new mixtures. These uh, uh, alternative materials became almost as uh, as uh, solid as the as the uh, full ceramic inlays, which uh, in the future term become uh, more and and more uh, available. Since nowadays you can use them and as inlays with a new CAD CAM system, it's a computer generated uh, system. So the uh, the cost for uh, for bigger cavities of uh, uh, ceramic inlay uh, dropped significantly. So, what to do now? So, to understand what to uh, what to do in regard of the uh, measurements in 2019, and uh, uh, in regard of uh, of the question, if you can ban it for children, why can't you ban it for all? You have to look at the positions of the stakeholders. So, if we are uh, listening to the people, uh, concerned people, and uh, the environmental uh, organization, and uh, and the science say, well, of course, mercury is, is toxic. We know this, and we should definitely do something. That's what also the um, the Minamata Convention um, decided. And uh, so we have to find a way through uh, to to uh, through for the change. Also, if we have uh, uh, several interests from other sides, so the dentists, the uh, private insurances, and uh, industries would still uh, prefer to earn uh, with uh, with amalgam or even with the alternatives they use, and they can uh, use for a better price. And uh, also with the public insurers, we want to save money. And I would like to show you a com complications with uh, an example of Germany. So in Germany we have uh, the full uh, um, reimbursement system. So we have a full reimbursement system, and we have uh, the high demand for alternatives for health and uh, aesthetic reasons. So we have. Uh, Insurances on the other side, which in favor of amalgam as standard uh, treatment, and uh, we have uh, the, the situation that dentists charge extra money for for composites. So they are um, quite happy to uh, if the patients don't want to want the amalgam because uh, they can reduce their own exposure and uh, and use uh, composites for. Uh, for an extra payment, but um, what happens if if the dentists don't want to use amalgam at all? And there have been uh, significant changes in the regulation that uh, since uh, 2004, um, dentists are, are officially allowed to choose not to to offer um, uh, amalgam at all, and that amalgam itself 
is not longer found or explicitly required as standard treatment. But uh, the the uh, insurance companies are still communicating it. Uh, it's uh, not not very clear for the insurance companies. Still, amalgam should be the material of choice. So the therefore the the dentists should use composites uh, for free if they are not going to offer amalgam. But what they do is that they use since more than 30 years these uh, time-saving alternatives which we were uh, talking about before. So glass ionomers, compomers, or bulk fill materials were uh, were used for all this time and were uh, uh, they were approved. They were uh, established so that the the uh, use of um, amalgam um, was dropping until uh, underneath ten uh, percent. So what are are the challenges now? Challenges are the main challenges are that the insurance companies on their side still ignore the alternatives and force dentists to work uh, illicitly uh, with these uh, time saving and uh, cost effective alternatives. And um, amalgam using dentists don't inform the patient about these alternatives, they just uh, give them the choice of or amalgam or you have to do an, uh, an extra payment and this is uh, it's a big challenge for us to to find a way to re reveal this and to do it publicly and to inform patients um, uh, about their, their rights and uh, we have a, a great opportunity now with the, uh, with the new decisions of the Minamata Convention that we can on a, on a first hand encourage insurances uh, which in, in favor alternatives. So we can take the measurements, Elena was talking about before, that this is the measurement required by the Minamata Convention, even though um, the member states can, can choose from this, but this would be a, a very good uh, um, point, for, uh, in, especially in Germany, to, to start out just to um, to stop the reimbursement, the public reimbursements uh, uh, for amalgam. And the second way would be to, first, if we are going to have, a, um, if we have stopped the reimbursement of amalgam and uh, the alternatives are be becoming recognized, the uh, use of amalgam completely becomes uh, uh, useless and uh, therefore we could ban amalgam in the 2020 which would be a great opportunity because uh, since in 2020 all other uh, main uh, mercury containing products will be banned at all and the medical devices guideline will enter into force and restrict the use of hazardous uh, substances in the materials and there will be a, a set up a new standard that uh, for the corrosion rate and the alternatives will get safer because we have a mandatory uh, um, uh, transparency for the composition. So this would be a, uh, an ideal uh, uh, date to to, to uh, um, base out amalgam entirely. And of course, also the industry will profit the benefit because since they are um, going to to be able to. Um, promote their products uh, worldwide. So what we can do is uh, we should definitely learn from each other and to learn from, uh, for example, from what Sweden did where um, the insurances stopped reimbursing uh, um, money for amalgam already in 99. And then in the second step, they stopped banned amalgam entirely in, in uh, 2009. We should learn from Austria and Slovakia where now the um, glass mirrors are being, being, being recognized. And uh, if we are talking to NGOs, we should now raise, uh, raise the awareness, awareness about the alternatives and uh, raise the awareness of uh, dentists who are using, uh, using them and still we should watch out what is the, the awareness about uh, amalgams itself. So if uh, 
if I look up in the newspaper, uh, there were at least four uh, where it was communicated that uh, that the amalgam are consisting only about of three uh, percent of uh, of mercury that there's almost no more mercury left, which is absolutely not true, and it was because of a, 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 a wrong entry in Wikipedia. And we are, I've been asking all our partners to look it up in their countries. What does Wikipedia say? What does the public say? Is it already, uh, is, 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 is it published, is it uh, um, communicated that mercury uh, amalgam consists to more than 50% of mercury? And uh, I hope you do this and we will join our goals. Thank you very much for your attention. If you'd like to have uh, further information, please look up uh, the PDFs and uh, uh, on the website of Healthcare Without Harm and on our site. Thank you very much, Florian. I think it's a great presentation highlighting some of the opportunities and challenges of, of particular member states in light of implementing uh, national strategies towards phasing out gentle amalgam, but also uh, given the implementation of the 2017 Mercury Regulation. We would like to ask some uh, questions. Uh, we have one question uh, for Elena. Uh, do the member states monitor somehow if the dental practitioners follow the ban of using the amalgam in the vulnerable groups listed in the regulation? Uh, thank you, Maya. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I hope they do so because this is part of the, of the regulation now. Uh, as far as we know, there have been some directions passing from uh, uh, down to the dental associations, uh, take care about that. But uh, indeed, uh, the enforcement of this uh, of this part of the regulation is something that uh, not only us but everybody will have to uh, to be aware of. And that's why also awareness will be very important, uh, also to the consumers. And then uh, whoever finds out that uh, this is actually not happening. They need to know of their rights so that uh, this is brought up into light. Uh, I don't know if uh, Florian also had uh, uh, some more uh, discussions on this uh, in Germany uh, on how this is potentially controlled, but this is also quite recent. So maybe measures are already are about to be taking uh, place in the different member states. Thank you very much for your answer. Let's have another question for Florian. Uh, Florian, do you also concentrate your efforts on educating the general public as an important stakeholder that can influence building related practices? If yes, could you provide examples of such initiatives? We, we are, of course, we are um, very much in, on our campaign um, using the, the public media going to, we had just had a, um, a, a TV um, documentary, uh, also informing the patients and, and directly saying, well, you have, uh, there are these alternatives, talk to your dentist if he gives you only the choice which has, you can use on composite and uh, which you have to pay a lot for, uh, or you use amalgam. And um, we are uh, also having uh, um, um, trying to to build up a network for uh, for dentists, which are uh, completely mercury-free, which are not using it uh, at all. So we are uh, having a, a list of those dentists. We, we provide the um, patients with the information, tell them that if you are, uh, if you don't want to use amalgam, maybe you could just uh, uh, go to a dentist which is not uh, um, using it and uh, and try to find a second opinion about what will be the right material for uh, um, uh, material for for Europe uh, carriers or for Europe uh, problem, and um, we we definitely need the the, the public aware, awareness uh, right now. But we have also strong partners now. We uh, with this problem we had the the consumer protection organization. Organization, um, made the main organization, at least in, in, in Germany, uh, which is now on our side to say, like, if the people, if there are these alternatives, 
and we know they are and they're in use for so many t years, um, then people have to, have to know. And we we would ask also do to, to, um, to continue with this building up a network and to help each other for 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 this uh, awareness. Our next speaker, uh, Charlie Brown. Charlie is president of the World Alliance for Mercury for Dentistry, a global umbrella created in 2010 of environmental NGOs, consumer groups, and health professionals working united to phase out the use of mercury amalgam dental fillings. The World Alliance has aggressive mercury-free dentistry campaigns in 40 nations, including several of the EU member states. Charlie has been to 31 nations working for mercury-free dentistry. The US NGO Charlie Leeds is consumers for dental choice. And Charlie will be addressing today the issue of how the European Union influences the world as it faces out amalgam. Charlie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thank you again, Jinquia, Maya, and uh, we really appreciate the uh, dedication of Healthcare Without Harm, which uh, years ago uh, began a campaign against mercury in medical devices. Um, first thermometers and blood pressure devices, and uh, more recently, dental amalgam. Um, and now uh, it is just uh, great to partner with uh, with you. We are the World Alliance for Mercury-Free Dentistry and have been partnering with uh, the European Environmental Bureau and its uh, affiliate Zero Mercury Working Group in Europe for a number of years. And now it's great to work with healthcare without harm. Um, I, I, these things, of course, do not just happen. The major successes in Europe, and they are major successes, they happen because uh, women and men uh, basically decide this is work that must be done. It's time to get organized and move. And a decade ago, more than a decade ago, Elena Limbiardi Centimo assembled a small group of people for a European conference to determine can we proceed toward ending mercury amalgam. And that was just a dream. But, I, but a decade later, last year in Berlin, Florian Schulze, who is the leader of the World Alliance for Mercury-Free Dentistry in Europe, assembled an ex, a group in a, a summit in Berlin to plan the end of amalgam. Now, I want to say, because some of these people are with us today on the phone, some of the same people, not just Elena, were in the, in the trenches for more than a decade, such as mein Freund Peter Onsorge, a physician in Germany and his organization, and mein Freund Reinhard Lauer, danke to both Reinhard and Peter for a decade of work that led us to where we are going. Uh, and we are going toward the end of amalgam uh, in Europe, and, and uh, we, we, as the World Alliance for Mercury-Free Dentistry, are so pleased that Europe has led the way. And civil society, of course, started first. That's the way democracy should operate. Civil society comes first. Then the government starts listening. Uh, it's hard to get them to listen, of course, but they will listen. And, and, uh, and so that's, that's obviously fantastic. There is a team of us right there. That's how big the NGO organization is. Of, 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 uh, of, of the World Alliance for Mercury Free Dentistry. That's just the ones that were in Geneva. Two of the people in that picture uh, include Gohar Kojayan of Armenia, I think who's on the phone, and, and she has uh, uh, led uh, in very many ways all of Europe uh, with working with Elena for the Zero Mercury Working Group. And my very good friend, Himsing Hurineg, who is here from Mauritius, Leo Maurice, and uh, Himsing, actually Europe is leading the world. Europe is ahead of the world. Mauritius was ahead of Europe. Mauritius ended Amalgam for Children back in 2014, thanks to him, things uh, just fantastic work. Um, the World Alliance for Mercury-Free Dentistry has has uh, um, 60 partners from around the world, and we do, as of course, work with our European partners quite closely. We're, we're delighted that we have partners in uh, in La France, uh, Non au Mercure Dentaire, qui a retourné comme un ONG important et vigoureuse. I believe uh, Antoine Leguyer and perhaps Lorette Casal are with us, and we're just very appreciative of what they've done leading that uh, NGO. We also have NGOs. Uh, working with us in España and Portugal and in Denmark and in Sverige and Polska with uh, Eco Unia and obviously in Deutschland and obviously in the UK 
with my closest partner uh, in this whole thing has been the, the dentist, the chief dental officer now of the World Alliance for Mercury-Free Dentistry, Dr. Graham Monroe Hall, now retired after uh, 40 years of fantastic dental work as a, as a, UK, as a UK dentist. Uh, one other who assembled at, at back 10 years ago and returned to the summit in Berlin and played a, has played such a crucial role is my American friend Peter Maxson uh, from Brussels, now in Brussels. Uh, Peter has written reports to show that amalgam is more expensive counting environment. It's not a close call. You count the environmental costs of amalgam. Amalgam is incredibly expensive. Once you cost all the dent, the, the pro-mercury dentists that are outsourcing the cost to everybody else, to the fishermen who can't fish, to the landlords that have mercury in their pipes, to the funeral directors that must pay for all the cremation equipment. All those things are because the pro-mercury dentists keep using mercury. Now, of course, we've got many and a growing number of mercury-free dentists, and we're going to have more of them in South Asia because Pakistan on the left, and that's, that's uh, Mahmoud Khawaja on the far right of the left picture, has led the way to Pakistan doing exactly what you did in Europe, ending amalgam for children under 15, for the pregnant women, and for the breastfeeding women. Bangladesh is also, and that's Shariar Hossein, the executive vice president of the World Alliance, and on the far left. Left and on the far right, Sadiqa Sultana, head of the uh, several-year-old Asian Center for Environmental Health, an umbrella organization for the largest continent on Earth. We are meeting with a one-star and two-star general, the chief doctor, chief physician, and the chief dentist of the Bangladesh Army, which has phased out dental amalgam. It's a model for any army anywhere around the earth. Obviously, Bangladesh is not full of uh, financial resources, but they're full of great willpower, full of visionary people like the general, the man second from the left is the chief dentist, an outstanding mercury-free dentist, and one that said that, that just decided we will become a mercury-free uh, country. Nigeria is also leading the way. They are going to mercury-free dentistry as a 1-1 for children, as a 1-1-2020, and then going to go all the way three years later, they are uh, they have a brochure right there you can see in front of you. Those are the kind of things that we see constantly uh, succeeding. Now, Europe did something else very important, and that was to, to uh, put the scientists into play. Two different scientific committees, I think they've been merged into one now in Europe, but one is for uh, emerging and, and, and health risks, one is for environmental risks, both of them are there. Amalgam is a secondary poisoning. So, you know, it's no longer a situation that people say, well, I don't have amalgam. I don't have to worry. The answer is you do have to worry because that mercury from dental amalgam is getting into the fish that children are eating or that anyone is eating. It's getting into the vegetables. It is a pervasive bioaccumulative toxin as 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 uh, Elena pointed out and it is it is extremely uh, it is it is toxic we know how toxic it is and we know how dangerous it is the the science committee on amalgam says basically science committee said we just don't shouldn't use amalgam for children pregnant women nursing mothers that amalgam is tooth unfriendly and they also the European Union no longer vouched for its safety so once all the science was over Europe could move into the parliament and 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 when the manufacturers, by the way, got out, let me just point that out. The manufacturers decided they would get out. So all that's left lobbying for mercury fillings are what I call the pro-mercury dentists, uh, the dentists who are still using it, and they have their own lobby group. They do not speak for dentists. They only speak for the dwindling band of pro-mercury dentists. They, they're, they're active in Brussels. They're active in Geneva. They're active in London. They're active in Washington and Chicago. But believe me, they are not speaking for a big group, and the politicians need to realize that that's that's the that's the uh, uh, fading group. In fact, dental associations outside of the rich countries, such as in such as in Vietnam on the left, are saying we don't want amalgam anymore. And I was in Hanoi, and the hospitals there are the dental hospitals are going mercury free. They have big hospitals with only dentists there. A little different from our system in the U.S., but it's just uh, it, those are mercury free. And I saw it in person when I was in Hanoi. Um, now, as I say, the NGOs are the ones that did this, and with that agenda, with that uh, wind behind our backs, uh, we're saying to the, the world, as I said to the Minamata Convention Conference of the Parties 1 last year in Geneva, uh, was uh, your children 
are equally important. Children in Asia, Latin America, North America, uh, Africa are equally important to the children of Europe. And that's why everybody needs to do what Europe has done, and that movement is happening. You did it, Europe, and uh, you did it, Mauritius, and that is really important. So the education is moving, as we as we have seen with the brochure in Nigeria. There's just all kinds of information. Uh, the, the In the U.S., and maybe in some countries, the mercury, most countries, it was hidden. The dentists, who use, they don't want to tell people they're using mercury. In the U.S., they call it silver fillings. Uh, in, in, in France, they call it plumbage, as if to say it's only lead. I don't know why they want to brag it's plumbage, but they're also lying. It's not plumbage, it's not lead, and it's not silver. That's lying. Now, i got to get to something very important on this slide. Europe is still exporting. Europe is still exporting amalgam, even Sweden which ended amalgam so many years ago. This is a troubling, horrible pattern by the United States and Canada, by Australia, by, by, the, uh, by Germany, Sweden, France, the UK, a troubling, troubling pattern of banning a substance but continuing to export it to Africa and to South Asia and to Brazil and so on. That must stop. Lead paint is an example. Lead paint was banned where I live in the U.S., in Canada, Europe, Japan. It was exported. The U.S. manufacturers just kept exporting it to the poor countries, the developing countries. Europe must stop exporting amalgam. And when you move to the phase out, and there is a pattern, Elaine explained it, I'll, I'll re-explain it. There is a, a, a not a pattern, but a, but a set timetable in Europe. You must include, please include, banning the exports of amalgam or the materials. The, 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 Swede, the Swedish company is clever because they export everything but the mercury, and then the, and then the mercury is sold separately, and then you end up with amalgam fillings in Bangladesh, and, 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 which is trying to get rid of them. But when you have this, these, 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 these profiteers who think, I, I, don't care about the, I don't care about black children, I don't care about brown children, I just want to make money, well, that means governments like Sweden and governments like the entire European Union have to stand up and say, when we end amalgam in Europe, we're not going to export it to the world, as we did in lead paint. And again, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm throwing stones in a glass house because in the United States, we do it too. We're equally guilty and we've got to stand up. Now, you are moving ahead of the United States. It's helping us. It's helping us a lot with our uh, regulators in the United States, what you're doing, because they look bad if they, because they aren't doing what Europe is doing. Uh, led by uh, an incredible member of parliament, Stefan Eck, equally incredible member of the European Parliament, an equally important member of the European Parliament, Michel Ravasi of France and, and Stefan Eck of Germany, the European Parliament said, we want the ban. We want a whole ban, total, phase it out. That brought them to the negotiations table with the Council of Europe, who was lukewarm, who had cold feet, wouldn't move forward, but the compromise was this in front of you. Three important steps. Ending amalgam last July for children, pregnant women, nursing mothers. We think we understand that's not working very well in Poland. We understand it's working great in Germany. It seems to be mixed, but it is the law. It's the law for all 28 member states, and it must be obeyed, and civil society is working to see it's obeyed. Now, 2019 is a, the, 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 the whole issue shifts from Brussels to the 28 or 27 member states. Um, and that would be uh, each country submitting its plan by next July 1. And Healthcare Without Harm is going to have charts, is going to have a website, is going to create these pressures by showing who's moving fast. Thanks to Florian Schulze, Deutschland is moving fast. Some countries are moving fast. Some are not yet ready to go. But we are going to turn up the heat. We, meaning the European Environmental Bureau, Healthcare Without Harm, the World Alliance for Mercury Free Dentistry, and our allies, NGOs, and the member states to say the countries are going to have to submit a plan. We already know it's banned for the children, a mercury free future for the children of Europe. Fantastic. We need to reach further, maybe to all young women, for example, not just the ones that are demonstrably pregnant or the breastfeeding and and maybe maybe just an age cutoff and then we just move to the end that's how norway did it that's how sweden did it and speaking of the wind to our back this is fantastic the executive director of un environment the very top person in the world for environmental work executive director of un environment 
is the Honorable Eric Salheim from Norway. Back in 2008-09, Eric Salheim was the Environment Minister for Norge, for Norway, and he banned dental amalgam, first in the world. He's very proud of that. We have talked to him. I've met with him. He wants to keep moving forward against dental amalgam. So we've got uh, we've got a, a, a real support at the very top of UN Environment. And then in 2020, after the attention has shifted to the member states in 2019, it shifts back in 2020 to the to the to Brussels and the Commission and the Parliament and decisions on are we going to recommend the full phase out of amalgam? By then, we think the track record will be clear. The record will be clear that, that amalgam needs to go. We think the opposition will be a lot less. Remember, the no, pro-mercury dentists are declining in number, uh, dying out perhaps because they use mercury, and, 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 uh, and the, the ascendancy is the mercury-free dentists and the country's pushing for mercury-free dentistry. Uh, this is a picture of us at the Parliament in Strasbourg, the European Parliament, just a great team, and I want to point to the young lady here in the red who is third from the right, uh, Marie Grossman is uh, one of the great heroes in Grande Roll pour la cause de la dentisterie sans mercure. Marie of Lyon, France, uh, led the, the non-o-mercure dentaire for many years, has had some health issues, has stepped back for new leadership, but she has been really my hero in Europe. She just did such fantastic work, energized the parliament, and just put together an incredible campaign. So, uh, Genquia, Danka, merci, gracias, uh, talk. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to work with uh, Europeans, and it's great to work with the NGOs listening from around the world. Thank you much, Charlie, for your inspiring and very motivating presentation. Uh, I believe that because of time constraint, constraints, we have time for only one question for Charlie. Uh, Charlie, you have repeatedly mentioned Europe being a model for other parts of the world regarding phasing out amalgam use. Uh, what is the single most important thing that Europe could learn from partners abroad besides banning the export of am amalgam? Europe can learn from partners abroad the institutional change that 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 that, that accentuates that that galvanizes that that synergistically ends amalgam. The armies. The army of Bangladesh, the army of India, third largest in the world, is ended amalgam. So think of moving to government programs like the armed forces, uh, hospitals like the hospitals in Vietnam. If you have these centers of health care, government programs, uh, government uh, 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 such as South Asians have done in India, Bangladesh, hospitals such as has been done in in uh, Vietnam, uh, changes, massive changes in the dental curriculum such as been done by uh, Nigeria, uh, the dental curriculum, and, and so so you so you've got hospitals, you've got arm, the armed forces, you've got the dental schools, and the fourth would simply be the dental associations. I, I frankly I don't know why the Council of European Dentists and the British Dental Association don't wake up and smell the coffee. Malcolm has no future, and we love to work with the dental associations in Tanzania and in Nigeria and 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 in Bangladesh and in Vietnam and in in and, and all over the world. We are working closely. I mean, we when I go into a country, we meet with the leaders of the dental. Like Ghana. I want to a funny story. The Ghana Dental Association president. We met with him with our NGO leaders in in Accra, and the and the guy was defending amalgam in his hat as head of the dental association. After a while, I just said, you know, it's not a good material. And he looked at me. He says, I never use amalgam. Never. There, you don't have. You won't see it in a single amalgam capsule or an amalgam bottle in this office. So really, even the dental association leaders are walking away from amalgam. So I, I say, I, you know, we've got, you know, there are there are definite prototypes to think about from other countries. Let's let's get the dental associations to wake up and smell the coffee, which they've already done all over the world. Let's work on the hospitals. Let's work on the army. Let's work on the dental schools, and let's move Europe away from mercury and let's not listen to the so-called experts that say uh, oh we oh we we've got the answer we we answers such as we'll end it in Europe and we won't end it in other countries start listening to people who are interested in detoxifying dentistry and detoxifying the world and those leaders those are women and men from all over the world as well as in your continent Thank you much, Charlie for you.
And sir, uh, I Florian, I would like to thank you very much for joining us today and highlighting the significance of phasing out dental amalgam in Europe and all over the world, in fact. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants for joining us today as well. Uh, I would like to remind you that the recording of the session and the presentations will be sent to all of you uh, in the coming weeks, as well as they will be available on our website. I encourage you to follow our work on uh, dental amalgam in the upcoming months as well. And if you're interested in the topic, you can find more resources on chemicals as well as mercury in, in particular on our websites and materials. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, and I wish you a, a good evening. Thank you.